All right, hello again, everyone. This is MTED 110, and today we are doing lecture 7B. So we're gonna finish chapter seven today. Um, this is actually a pretty involved lecture, and this is a lecture that's different than the previous ones because I want you to do a lot of this stuff on your own uh, in your groups at home. So the thing I'd recommend the most is that you try to set up a synchronous Zoom meeting between you and your group members. And there'll be times in the lecture where you'll basically have to do a bunch of problems and then compare some things. So I highly recommend that you do that because it's, it's really what's gonna help you understand these ideas. Um, we're gonna see how to use a new manipulative today. And then we're also going to compare some manipulative emulators. And then we're also gonna see two videos of some children working with fractions and making sense of them. I think that's really cool. Um, so it might be a little bit of a long lecture, but it's, it's a good one, it's an important one. All right, let me go ahead and get started here. We left off right about here last time and let's see where we're gonna go next. Okay, so here's the, the first question. We're gonna talk about multiplying and dividing now. We talked about addition and subtraction last time. So my question to you is this, why do we multiply fractions the way that we do? Think about that for a minute. Hmm, yeah, why is that? <laughs> Excuse me. Um, in particular, this, this is how we multiply fractions. A over B times C over D is just A times C over B times D. And the question is why? Like, why do we actually work it out that way? Why don't we have to do any sort of crazy manipulation, right? Um, well, let's look at this example and maybe this will clear things up a little bit. So this says Julia mowed four fifths of the lawn and her brother James raked two thirds of the part that was mowed. How much of the total lawn was raked? So what we're gonna do here is this. Remember, multiplication can always be represented as an area. And this one lends itself very nicely to an area model actually, because we're talking about a rectangular lawn essentially, right? Um, it is, actually doesn't even have to be rectangular. See, that's the thing. The lawn can be any shape. We're just talking about four fifths of the lawn. Well, we can take whatever that shape is and basically pretend that we can squish it into a rectangle and then start demarking fifths. And that's what we're gonna do first. So first off, we're gonna pretend that this is the lawn. And what I've done is I've highlighted four fifths. So this is how we do these area models. I might even go up here and label one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. One fifth. Okay, one thing I wanna point out is notice that I didn't say one fifths, two fifths, three fifths, four fifths. No, 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 I don't wanna do that. I wanna indicate that each one of these is one fifth. I don't want them to think, I don't want my students to think that they're representing different sized objects. Those are all one fifth. That's the idea. So or I should say this right here is one fifth. And so is this, and so is this, and so is this. Those are each one fifth of the lawn. Since I've highlighted four of them, I've got four fifths. All right, now it says that her brother James raked two thirds of the part that was mowed. So that's gonna look like this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the other dimension. We're gonna cut the other dimension into thirds. Cause again, the denominator there, oops, where is it? There is a third. So I'm gonna go over here and I would say one third, one third, one third. This was one fifth, right? One fifth, one fifth one fifth, one fifth. And so the question is how much of the total lawn was raked? Well, the part that was raked is this part right here. Okay, you can kind of see it, the part that's double shaded, right? That's the part that was raked. And so we just need to list what quantity that is. Well, here's the coolest part. <laughs> here's the coolest part. Um, how big is each one of those little squares? So in other words, what size is this square? Think about it for a minute, think about it. How big is that square? Okay, now say that out loud. How big is that square? That's right, it's 1 15th. Don't believe me? Remember the area model. Pretend this is just your, pretend that one square is the only thing you're looking at and one side length is 1 5th and one side length is one third. What's the area? It's one third times one fifth, which is one fifteenth. So let me back that up. This is one fifteenth. And each one of those little squares represents the quantity one fifteenth. So now my question is, how many of those fifteenths are double shaded or shaded in this like aquamarine turquoise color? How many? 
Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the answer here is eight fifteenths. Eight fifteenths of the lawn was raked. And that also makes sense too, because how many of these little squares uh, comprise the entire rectangle? Well, there's three by five, that's 15. There's 15 of those squares. That's why each one is one fifteenth. Isn't that amazing? It's like magic, right? Um, but it's not, it's just math. And it's just the definition of multiplication and the area model, that's all it is. So remember what I had said earlier, uh, the, the models don't change, the, the numbers don't change. It's all very consistent and that's the whole point. We want that consistency so that students understand these are numbers, these are actual quantities that we're playing with. Super cool stuff, I think. Anyway, um, okay, so, so again, algebraically or arithmetically, this is the operation. Um, we're basically doing two times four over three times five. And that picture shows you how. Uh, the one thing I wanted to point out here, second, yeah, okay, uh, is this. Um, when we were considering the quantity four fifths, the unit that we were that we were comparing to was the entire lawn, right? It's four fifths of the lawn. And this part here is critical. And this is usually what throws students off the most. That's what we call the referent unit. And I'll refer to it a lot more in chapters eight and nine, but let's talk about it now. Referent unit. So in this case, we're referring to the unit. We're gonna call the lawn a unit and we're gonna take four fifths of that unit. That's the idea. Um, so when we were talking about four fifths, the referent unit was the entire lawn. But when we were talking about the quantity two thirds, the referent unit is the part of the lawn that was mowed. So the referent unit changed, and that's something that you wanna keep in mind, and that's gonna help us a lot in chapters eight and nine, trust me about that. You'll see, actually you don't have to trust me, you'll just see. Um, the referent unit is critical for these types of problems because the referent unit will change oftentimes within a problem. Uh, okay, so what was the referent unit for eight fifteenths? Well, that was the entire lawn again, right? How much of the total lawn was raked? Eight fifteenths of it. So the answer to that one is the entire lawn again. All right. So that's the referent unit for 8 fifteenths. Um, the way that you can kind of think about it is this. You can think about it as two thirds of four fifths of one. So basically we did four fifths of the unit, the lawn, and then we did two thirds of that thing. And what is that thing? That's the part of the lawn that was mowed. So the referent unit kind of changes as we go along. Try to keep your eye on the referent unit and you'll, you'll hear me say it over and over. Of what, of what, of what, of what? And that's what I mean, because it changes. All right, in fact, anytime anybody ever tells you a fraction of any type or a ratio, a percentage, you should always ask them, of what? <laughs> what of what, right? What are you comparing to? What's your referent unit? Um, oh yeah, so I just said this a moment ago, but multiplication is multiplication. It's still the same. Just because we're doing fractions doesn't mean anything about that operation has changed. It can always be represented as an area. So let's do some freehand, okay? Let's try some freehand ones. Let's model 3 fourths times five eighths using the area model. Now, what I had said in the past is still holds here. We have to look at the denominators and the denominators are gonna be our guide. They're gonna tell us how to divide up our different dimensions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw a square. Okay, and I'm doing a square in particular. Actually, will this snap? Ah, it won't snap, that's okay. I'm doing a square because this square represents the unit. So I'm actually just gonna say this once. This is the unit square, unit square. And the reason I'm picking a unit square is because I'm now gonna cut one dimension into uh, fourths and then the other dimension into eighths. So let's do that right now. Fourths, so I'm gonna cut this one into fourths. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and erase the one and the one. Just remember this is the unit square and this big square represents the quantity one, all right? So this up here, that's one fourth, that's one fourth, that's one fourth, and that's one fourth. Now I'm gonna take the other dimension and cut it up into eight equal sized pieces. There are my fourths. There are my eighths right there. Let me close that guy, there we go. And then I'm not gonna label all of these, but I'm gonna label at least a couple to say that this is one eighth. I'll just label one. Each one of those is one eighth. One eighth, there we go. Um, all right, so now that we've got our denominators taken care of, we've cut our unit square up into how many pieces? That's right, it's 32 pieces, right? Because it's a four, ah, 
<laughs> because it's a four by eight grid now. So there are 32 of those tiny little rectangles. Notice now that they're not squares. They're not gonna be squares because they don't have equal side lengths, right? One side length is one fourth, the other side length is one eighth. And that's why it shows up that way in my picture. It doesn't look like squares because they're not squares and they shouldn't be squares. Um, okay, so let me erase these little guys here. Um, now that I know how to partition my unit, I'm gonna shade three fourths of it. And three fourths is right here. There we go. So that's three fourths. And then now, because uh, remember before we said it's like, oh, three fourths of five eighths, but we said it's three fourths of five eighths of one. I'm just gonna shade three fourths of the entire thing. So here we go, I'm gonna pick a different color, or I'm sorry, a five eighths of the entire thing. So now I need five eighths. Let's see, that's gonna be one, two, three, four, five. There we go. And that's okay if we shade that little bit at the end there on the, uh, on, on the right over there, because we're still just looking at the, color, the squares that are double shaded, double shaded. Um, and let's see how many we have. How many of those squares are double shaded? Or maybe I should say, uh, how many of those squares are purple looking? I'm going to highlight mine right here. There we go. That right there is how many of those squares? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. That's 15. And 15 what's? How much does each one of those little rectangles represent? One thirty second. So we have 15 30 seconds, and that's the answer. That's the actual answer, 15 30 seconds. So this is how you do it. This is how you model multiplication of fractions. It's just the area model again. You're just cutting up your pieces, your, your, your unit into equal size pieces. That's all it is. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Okay, so what's next? Um, okay, how about this one? So I've noticed that students often struggle with this model when one of the numbers is bigger than one. But again, you, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to fret. You just have to keep in mind what the referent unit is. So let's try it. Uh, we're going to draw our unit, our unit square. Okay, but here's the thing. One of the factors in our product is three. So we're doing three times two fifths, which means I'm going to need at least three units to talk about. There's three units right there. So I'm going to add two more unit squares to this. It's a little better. There we go. And I'm just going to emphasize that these are unit squares again. Okay, these are unit squares. Okay, and now let's think about what we're trying to model here. We're trying to model three times two fifths, or we can think about it as two fifths of three. It's totally up to you. But the thing to keep in mind here is that one dimension is already taken care of, this one right here. This, is, this dimension is three, that length, I should say. That length is three in that dimension. And now we need to be able to divide that up. We need to divide our rectangle up into fifths as well, all right? Because we're taking two fifths of three, of three. What's the referent unit? Of three, all right? So we need to basically go over here and cut this length into five equal sized pieces. One, two, three, four, and that'll give us five, right? And I'm just gonna emphasize that these are fifths. One fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. Yeah, it looks a little gross. Let me do this instead. Dot, 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 there we go. So those are all fifths. And here's the best part. We're taking two fifths of three. So that's what we're gonna highlight right now. Here's two fifths of three. Actually, I'm gonna go this way. There we go. So now I've shaded two fifths of three. Uh, if I wanted to, I could shade all three of those unit squares since that's the next length, right? Since that's the next length. So if I really wanted to, I could go through and actually like shade the entire rectangle here to indicate that I've shaded the quantity three. And then we're gonna look for the ones that are double colored, right? We're gonna look for the, uh, the we're gonna look and see how many of those rectangles have both colors. 
I'm going to go ahead and erase the second color because I don't think we really need it here. But I just want to emphasize that it's it's technically like already shaded. Um, how you do this in practice is kind of up to you and your students and what they're comfortable with. Uh, but you can you can you know talk to me more about it if you're if you're confused or anything like that. All right. So again, we're just going to count how many of those things we have. How many of those rectangles are shaded? There's six of them. And now how much of the unit does each one of those rectangles represent? So I'm gonna pause here for a minute. I want you to think about that. Uh, what, uh, <laughs> what size is each one of those little skinny rectangles? How big is it? All right, now say it out loud. How big do you think it is? Hmm, let's think about it and take a look together. Okay, so I see that there are six shaded, and I notice that students often look at this and they're very, very tempted to say that the answer is 18. They think that that's a, or, I'm sorry, a 15th. They think that it's a 15th, right? Um, and so they'll often incorrectly say that that's six 15ths. But that's not quite right because I'm going to say this, 6 15ths of what? Of what? 6 15ths of what? 6 15ths of this entire rectangle, right? But what's the referent unit here? The referent unit is our unit square. Actually, I shouldn't do that part in red. The referent unit is our unit square. So we don't want to compare it to the whole length that we're looking at. We want to compare it to the unit square because that unit square is our referent unit. So let's think about that more carefully. It's not 6 fifteenths, right? It's not 6 fifteenths. How much does each one of these little rectangles represent when you focus on just the unit square? Let me just emphasize that the unit square is right there. So how much, and there's three of them, right? Here's the other two, right? So my question is, how much of that unit square is one of those rectangles? And that's where it kind of falls out, right? You realize that it's 1 fifth. It's 1 fifth of that unit square which makes sense. So that quantity represents one fifth. And then this is one fifth also. And this is one fifth of what? Of the unit square. So that's the thing. And then this is where students are like, wait, what? What? It doesn't make any sense. Remember, what's the length up here? What's this length? It's one. It's not three, it's one, right? It's a one. And one fifth times one is one fifth. So each one of those little rectangles has a size of one fifth. Now, if each one of those is a fifth and we have six of them, guess how much we've got? That's right, six fifths. And that's the answer. The answer is six fifths. Uh, and you don't believe me? Well, now look at the, uh, do, do the actual algebra, right? Fall back on that comfortable arithmetic that you remember from a child multiplying fractions, right? You're gonna get six fifths almost immediately. And you can actually see it. Oh, uh, you, you can even see it, right? Uh, oh, actually, I'm sorry. Let, let me let me say this. Six fifths is also equal to one and one fifth, right? And you can see that here because if I were to take, for example, these, or let me get a different color. If I were to take uh, these squares, or I'm sorry, these rectangles here and try to fill them out in here, I'm going to be able to fit three in there, giving me one whole unit, one whole unit. And then I'm going to have another one left over, one fifth of a unit one-fifth of a unit. So it's just like, boom, like everything is right there. Everything comes out so beautifully. Everything is so intimately connected. It just works. It just works so well. This is why I love the area model of multiplication so much. Oh, I'm getting choked up over it <laughs> in here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, so again, I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, we'll do more examples in the collaboration meeting. You should practice at home and so on and so on. And you'll get to do it on the activities too. So, oh yeah, so you try, great. I'm glad I included this. Um, I want you to draw an area model for the following products at home. So read over them for a second and think about them, and I'll give you a minute for that. All right, and now start writing them down. Take some time, draw a couple of those area models. Um, try some that you're afraid to do. Pick a couple where you're like, oh, I don't know if I can do that, and try it. It's okay. No risk. You're not in trouble. or anything. It's not going to matter if you get it wrong. It's okay you'll probably get it right. Okay, now let's move on. <clears throat> uh, oh yeah, so we can also show multiplication on a number line. So we saw the area model, let's do the number line next. 
let's model two thirds times four fifths. And I kind of explain how to do that here. The first thing that we do is we need to divide the unit, right? Divide the unit. So in our case, it's this entire length down here. There's the unit, all right? It's a unit line. Um, you're gonna divide that unit into five equal sized pieces. And that's to accommodate the four fifths. So we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna cut it up into five equal sized pieces, and then we're gonna shade four of them. So shade four of the pieces. And what I've done here is actually, I've done it in blue down below. Um, four of the pieces, it's the, it's the blue part shaded down here. That's four fifths of the unit. And now what we need to do is we need to, we need to take two thirds of that four fifths, right? That's what this is up here. That's two thirds of four fifths. And the way we do it is this, we divide each of those fifths into three pieces. And I use that for green, I use green for that one. Um, divide each fifth into three pieces. And that's what's going on right down here. And we're gonna end up with two thirds of four fifths. But here's the thing. Here's the thing I wanted to point it out. Point out. We're dividing it into three pieces, or I'm sorry, we're dividing each fifth into three pieces because we can think about this problem up here as this. We can think about it as um, one third of, what is it? One fifth times four. So it's one fifth or one third of one fifth times four, but then we're also gonna have times two in here. I'm just kind of pulling everything apart. So the idea here is this, the one third of one fifth is this little section right here. That's one third of one fifth, one third of one fifth, one third of one fifth, right? And notice now we're stopped at a fifth because it takes three of them to fill it out. So we've got one third of one fifth and then we're gonna have eight of those. And that's why you see that there's eight of them right here if you count them all up. But once you get those pieces to be equal size, and then you can actually just count how many they are. And that's exactly what we did in the area model, right? If you remember the area model, let me go back here. We split everything up. We split our unit. I'll, I'll go to this one, actually. We split our unit up, and then we just counted how many of those little pieces we had. It's the same thing going on right here with the number line. And you can see it right there. One third of four fifths. Two thirds of four fifths. Of what, of what, of what? Of the unit, the referent unit. Okay. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see it there. And let me point this out too. Notice that this really is, this really is two thirds of this length. Look at that. That's definitely two thirds of this. Definitely. And you can see it. The reason we were able to do that precisely is because of this step right here, dividing each, divide the unit into five equal size pieces, and then divide each of those fifths into three equal size pieces. And that's how you do that one. All right, so you try. Just like before, I want to give you a minute to try to model these products on a number line and try it out. And then we can talk more about it at the collaboration meeting. So go ahead and try to think about that and write them out and I'll give you a minute. Okay, let's move on. Um, all right, so now here's the fun thing. By the way, that's it for multiplying. <laughs> that's multiplying by a fraction. It's easy, right? Um, or I shouldn't say easy. I should say it's simple, right? It's simple once it makes sense. I don't know if it's easy per se. Uh, I think the, the number line model is a little bit funky to get used to, but you can, if you just remember to divide each of those like fifths into three equal size pieces, the denominators are always the guide. The denominators are always the guide and you're always gonna have to find a common denominator. There's the broken record coming out again, right? Okay, anyway. So here's the big question for dividing by a fraction. Why do we invert and multiply when we divide by a fraction? Why is that? So let me give you an example here. Uh, if I wanted to do something like two thirds divided by, oh, seven eighths, I'm sure all of you are told, oh, you just flip the second one and then multiply, right? Everyone knows that this is two thirds, two thirds, times eight sevenths, whoa, eight sevenths, which is gonna give us, oops, 16 over 21, right? Okay, why? <laughs> like, why did we do that? Why do you just say, oh, instead of division, just do multiplication instead, but flip one of them? Why does that work? We have to be able to make sense of that. Um, uh, here's another question. Do we need to pay attention to the referent unit when we're dividing? 
so remember with multiplication, we were constantly like, well, three fifths of what? Of the unit, of the lawn, of the part of the lawn that was raked. What's the referent unit? Do we need to pay attention to that when we're dividing? It's a good question. We'll find out. Uh, and when do we divide? What, in, in what contexts? How do we know when we're actually doing division as opposed to multiplication or addition or subtraction? Like, how do we know? We're going to see. Um, so this is from the Common Core Standards. And, and just check out what this says. It says, students need to be able to use the meaning, the meaning of fractions, the, multi, uh, the meaning of fractions of multiplication and division and the relationship between multiplication and division to understand and explain why the procedures for multiplying and dividing fractions makes sense. So after a student leaves fifth grade, uh, a student entering middle school, you could say, they need to be able to explain why you invert and multiply. And they need to be able to explain why you don't do that when you multiply already. Interesting, huh? Interesting. It's an interesting question, why? Well, that's why that one, uh, that one teacher in the video, she was like, well, you know, just, they were just being good students, just don't ask why, just invert and multiply, right? Yeah, that was my mathematical upbringing. We ain't about that anymore. We're not gonna do that anymore, right? All right, um, oh yeah, so one thing to say is that this is limited to the case of dividing unit fractions by whole numbers and whole numbers by unit fractions. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna do exactly that and we're gonna explain and explore why we do that. Okay, so here's an example. Three divided by one fifth equals what? This is what we're going to use to explain why we invert and multiply. So this is the question, right? This, anytime you see division, you always go back to the definition. It's asking, how many times does one-fifth fit into three? So how many one-fifths are inside of the number three? Well, first, how many fifths are inside of one? Well, one has five-fifths in it, so three has 15-fifths in it. Did you get that? There you go. So that means that three divided by one fifth is 15. Did you see it? Did you see it? <laughs> we inverted and multiplied. Did you catch it right there? It's weird, huh? <laughs> it's that fast. We already did it. We did the inversion and we did the multiplication. And you can see it right in here. First, how many fifths are in one? The reason is we're recognizing that we're doing this. 3 is equal to, th I'm sorry, 3 is equal to 3 times 1. So rather than ask how many fifths go into 3, let's just ask how many fifths go into 1, and then we can repeatedly add that quantity 3 times. There you go. That's a repeatedly add, right? What's repeatedly adding? That's multiplication. So the inversion is not really an inversion. That inversion is just a, a it's an artifact of the way that we write the symbols. <laughs> That's all it is. That's what the inversion is. The inversion really comes from asking this question right here. How many of those fractions are in your unit? And then once you know that, you can talk about repeatedly adding it. And that's where the multiplication comes from. So that's why. That's how and why. That's why we invert and multiply. Now you know why. You can ask why and you can explain why. Hopefully, right? And if not, you'll be able to explain by the end of the class. Um, yeah, so three should have three times as many fifths in it as one. Well, one has five fifths in it, so three has 15 fifths in it, and that's why we get the answer 15. There you go. Boom. Okay, uh, let's see it again, but this time let's not use a unit fraction. I don't think I use a unit fraction in this one. Yeah, okay. How about this? So again, same question. Go back to the very definition of division. How many times does two fifths fit inside of three? That's the question. Well, uh, oh yeah, there you go. Or how many two, oh yeah, how many two fifths are in three? Well, first, how many fifths are in one? Same thing as before. Well, one has five fifths in it, so three has 15 fifths in it. There we go. Three has 15 fifths in it. Uh, but now, how many sets of two one fifths can we make out of 15 one fifths? So now you got to realize, like, we've got a collection of 15 fifths, you know, like maybe here they are. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Those, and each one of those dots represents a fifth. Now we have 15 of them. How many sets of two can we make? Let's just count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We can do seven. And then what is this right here? What is that? Is it one? 
you might be tempted to say that it's seven and one fifteenth, but I would say one fifteenth of what? <laughs> seven, se- seven of what? Got to keep in mind what the referent unit is here now, right? Think about that. What is that thing? That single dot is a fifth, but that represents half of, a, of two fifths, right? That's half of one of these things right here. So if we're asking how many times we can fit two fifths inside of seven or inside of 15, or if we're asking how many pairs of two fifths we can take out of 15 fifths, well, there's seven whole pairs and then there's half of another pair. This is the half of another pair, half of two fifths. So the answer is seven and one half. That's the answer, right? And again, if you don't believe me, do this actual algebra, you know, invert and multiply, and you'll see that that's the answer. All right, so let's check this out. 15 divided by 2 is 7, and then there was that other half of a time, right? It's a half. That's the thing. What's the referent unit? So 3 divided by 2 fifths is 7 and a half. Pretty awesome, huh? There it is. So there, there's the inversion and the multiplication. Like, it's not really an inversion at all. It's just asking how many of those unit fractions fit inside of the unit and then repeatedly adding that quantity. And then also, if we wanted to use a non-unit fraction, we've got to start partitioning that result. Anyway, um, I can do it again in the collaboration meeting if you got questions, but I encourage you to think about it. In fact, let me go ahead and throw this up just to give you a cue to ponder this for a minute. Just think about it. And walk through it slowly, right? All right, uh, let's move on. Okay, um, so in general, uh, we can say this. This is just the formula again. This is the don't ask why, just invert and multiply. I wouldn't say memorize this formula, but make sense of it. Um, basically, you would take C over D and invert it as long as this number is not equal to zero. Or I should say more exactly, as long as C is not equal to zero. If C is zero, then you're dividing by zero. And we already saw in a previous lecture that you can't do that, right? So you can't divide by zero. All right, um, and now we know why. Now we know why you actually do that, which is really cool, I think. Uh, so here's a question. Why do we only invert the second fraction, the divisor? Mm, think about it. Oh, I still got the little, little thinker there. Mm, good, keep thinking about it. Uh, so young learners often make the mistake of inverting the dividend, which is the first thing, the, the number being divided, when they've not made sense of the formula. So in other words, if you just teach students this formula, they'll mess it up. Because uh, if there's no meaning or context behind it, then it's just totally like foreign to them. It's like a, it, it's like trying to speak a language when you don't know the words. You're just kind of like blah 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 blah, and then you're hoping that you got it right. No, that's not knowledge. You know what I mean? So you have to have students make sense of this formula because in the beginning, what they'll do is they'll try to invert this one because they just know they're supposed to invert something, and that's not good, right? That's bad news bears. Okay. Um, all right, so quiz and air rods, we finally get to see these things. Um, this is one of my favorite manipulatives, and I'm actually pretty bummed that we won't get to do this in person this time, but we do have these, uh, these virtual manipulatives that we can use. So uh, quiz and air rods are basically sticks. They're wooden sticks of different colors. There's 10 of them. I think you can kind of see that here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, you can probably guess why there's 10 of them because we have a decimal system. So having 10 of these things is very handy because you can use them to model like anything. Uh, actually, I have some right here. So let me go to the camera really quick and I can show you what they look like more, uh, more physically. So here we go. Okay, wait, maybe I can make this look really fancy. Okay, here we go. Ah, got it. These are not stuck together. I'm just pinching them just so. Okay, so these are a bunch of little rectangles. And the very last one down here, that's the unit. That's the unit, and it's a square. It's a unit square, right? Because it's the unit, so it should be like a unit. Um, actually, sometimes these are called, oof, it almost fell apart on me. Uh, sometimes these are called centimeter rods. And that's because each one of these things, like this over here, this is a cubic centimeter. So sometimes they're called centimeter rods, but I think Cuisinair rods sounds a lot cooler. So I say Cuisinair rods instead. Um, some people will just call them fraction bars. But again, Cuisinair rod sounds cooler. Uh, anyway, so the idea is this, you've got this length of 10, and then you've got this length of 9, and you've got all these different lengths. 
<laughs> you've got all these different lengths and we're going to use them in a re in really flexible ways. And then what we're going to do next, next, what you're going to do at home, I should say, is you're going to compare these to the pattern blocks. So let me see what's coming up next here. Yeah. Okay. So let's do some examples. Oh, there you go. Let's do some examples here. Um, they're a great alternative to pattern blocks. The one thing you want to keep in mind is that these are more about length. So don't think about area. These are all about how long those rods are, okay? Um, so we're going to do these examples here, but let me pull up the manipulatives here, the virtual manipulatives. Get that set up. One second. Okay, so let's check out Toy Theater first. Let's check out Toy Theater. There's a few options here. Um, you can use these fraction bars, but I actually found these to be less less flexible. See, I don't really like this so much because what you can do is you can like change the length. But the thing about Cuisinair rods is they're not so rigid, I would say, as this. So I wouldn't actually use the fraction bars personally. Um, which one? Oh, I was looking at fraction strips. This is another interesting one. So you can kind of do this. You can move one up there. You can do thirds, right? So this is essentially what Queez and air rods allow us to do. Um, you might also happen to notice that this thing here looks a lot like a strip diagram because that's what it is. It's a strip diagram, except when I've got these things, it's a physical strip diagram. Isn't that awesome? That's the whole thing. So we can translate, or sorry, translate. We can transfer from this kinesthetic manipulative to this visual representation, to the area model, to everything, right? It's all connected. Gorgeous. I love it. Um, Let's see what else they had on here. I was looking at this earlier. Where is it? Yeah, graph color bars. This is actually the one that I would recommend. So this one's the one I'd recommend because you can clearly see that it's meant to model. The only downside is the colors don't match. So if you look back at, um, one second, let me go back to the, the slides really quick. If you look back at this, the colors are somewhat standard, I would say. Not a big deal though, right? Shouldn't have to rely on the colors being uniform across everybody's use of, of these manipulatives. Not gonna work, not gonna happen, not realistic. Um, okay, so what you can do here is you can, again, you can just drag these bars up into the, the playing field and you can compare things, right? Exactly, and do stuff like that. So this is what you can use and then you can take a screenshot and that'll work. And then I think those are the two that I saw in here that would work well. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Yeah, that was it. Okay, I actually checked that other website, um, Cool Math for Kids, the, the website that had the pattern blocks manipulative that I preferred. They didn't have they didn't have a a, a quiz and error rod uh, virtual manipulative, so I didn't want to mention that. But let me go to my iPad now, and you can see this app that I've got. One second here. Okay, so same company that made the pattern blocks app makes a quiz and error rods app. There it is. So over here on the, let me do this. Here we go. Uh, over here <laughs> on the left, you've got all the different bars. I really, really like this particular app because it's very flexible. Um, and it's got a lot of options, I would say. Remember, you don't need to buy this, so don't buy it, okay? You don't have to, you, this stuff is free. You don't need to invest money in this. Um, but what you can do is just drag these bars out. There you go, there you go. And this is what we're gonna do. This is why these things are so fun. If I remember correct, oh yeah, you can also turn on the grid if you want. Might be kind of nice for us. Turn on the grid. There we go. And then where is it? Not more apps. Basic whole numbers. Yeah, so you can you can you can you can model whole numbers with these, but you can also model decimals, right? That's why there's ten of them. Uh, this one down here, the very last one, this lets you make it whatever length you want. That way, that's why that one's there. Um, you can do just letters if you wanted to talk about letters, uh, or we can do fractions. Now, what I love about this, is it this one right here? I can't remember. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so notice it's one-tenth, two-tenths, three-tenths, four-tenths. The, the issue with that is you want to be able to turn those off. So you can do this, label the whole, and that's what I actually prefer. And the reason I prefer that is because the referent unit is going to change a lot with these. And uh, this is something that you should think about when you're playing around with these. The referent unit is very important to keep in mind because it's what we're going to compare everything to. So I don't necessarily want to label them like this because then it chooses the unit to be this for me. But I don't always want that to be the unit. 
I actually get to pick what the unit is here, right here. See, down here it says the hole. Which one do I want to be the unit? How about the yellow one? I'll make the yellow one the unit. And now notice that the orange one is two. So that's kind of cool, huh? Anyway, so um, I tend to just say like, let's label the holes. It's a lot easier that way. And then if I want at the very end, I can be like, oh, let's label everything. And that kind of like, but uh, you'll see what I mean. You'll see what I mean. So let's do some examples before I get too carried away. Let's do one sixth plus one third. So I'm gonna clear everything. And I'm gonna choose the unit to be the orange, the orange bar. I'm just gonna label the, the whole unit. And let's do one sixth plus one third. So I need to pick a block that I can cut up into six equal sized pieces. Well, luckily these are centimeter rods. And so I, there is one that is exactly six pieces. That's the one I'm gonna call the hole. Let me see, is it this one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope, this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'm gonna call that the hole. That's the unit. Okay, select it. There we go. So now I've, I've there you go. I've, I've selected the unit. And now I need to model sixths. So I'm gonna do that, ready? Uh, here are my sixths. One, two, three, four, four, five, six. And I'm just showing you how these things work at this point. And then we need thirds. Oh, I suppose I should write this up. One sixth plus one third. That's what we're gonna model in a moment here. Um, let's see, the thirds should be these guys. Oh no, those are halves. Here we go, thirds. Oh, I keep doing that. There we go. Put that back. Just like so. Now look, if I do label all, it'll actually say that, right? And kind of, kind of cool, I think. Um, all right, so we've got sixths, we've got thirds, and now we just need to add them together. So with and air rods, what I would do is I would first show what my referent unit is. I would make this picture just to emphasize what those things are. And actually, in this case, I think I would probably leave those labels on just to say, oh, that's one, that's one sixth. Although, uh, what's nice about this app again is I don't want it to, um, I want it to reduce in this case. So I can do that by clicking this button down here. Uh, reduced or not reduced. That's what that is down there. But there's still no undo button. There's no undo button. I don't get that. So weird. Let me erase this. Okay. Um, so we've got six, we've got thirds. Now we need to add them together. So let's go ahead and do that. Put that guy back there. Um, and I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna pull out another unit. And I'm gonna say, here's one sixth. And here's one third. And what is one sixth plus one third? Oh, I had to double click this to get it to register that new thing that I dropped down. That's an interesting little, little uh, glitch, you could say. Um, then what I'm gonna do is notice that that is actually one half. There we go. And that's it. So this bit over here, actually I would say this bit over here is not even necessary. So you could basically just erase that. That's just kind of like me doing scratch work. This is actually showing the answer right here. And the key thing is that there's a referent unit. There's the quantity, right? Here's the referent unit. There's the quantity one sixth. There's the quantity one third. They've been brought together. They've been brought together, see? And then how much, what length does that give me? It gives me a length of one half. So I know for a fact that this is equal to one half. So that's, that's actually how you would model it. So I would actually, let me erase this just to give you a, a precise example. Let me erase all this stuff. Here we go, erase, erase, erase. Click, I'm gonna go ahead and select that and trash it. There we go. So this is how I would model this. There you go. First thing, my, my unit is there, the one is there. I see one sixth, I see one third, and I see that when you add them together, you get one half. Again, notice I didn't have any sort, I didn't do any sort of like algebra up here. I just used this model and that model led me to the answer. Oof, trying to pick up my fast circling there. That's the whole thing, right? Your students are gonna start with this model and then they have to go to the algebraic representation. That transition is hard for them to make if they don't have this model. Oops. Okay, so let's do the next problem. Let's clear everything. Let's do one third minus one fourth. This is gonna get a little interesting. So one third minus one fourth. Hmm. 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 Okay, well, if I'm talking about thirds and fourths, 
then that means I need to find a common denominator. And because three and four are relatively prime, the common denominator, the least common denominator is their product. It's 12. So I need something that I can cut up into 12 equal sized pieces. And this is where things get interesting. So I'm actually going to avoid using one of the, uh, the benefits of this particular app because if you're using the actual physical manipulative of these quiz and air rods, this is all you got. This is the longest one, that one right there, and it's 10 units long. I can cut it up into 10 units. So if I need 12, then I'm going to have to change my unit in, in a certain way, and I'll show you what I mean. This is why I'm going to turn off the labels now. Just label the whole, and let's keep the whole as that for now. Uh, I really wish it wasn't labeled at all. I don't want any labels now. I would like to label it myself. Let's see, can I even do that? Hmm, I don't think so. It definitely makes it stay one. So that's another limitation of this particular app. Uh, but that's only 10 equal size pieces, right? I could, if I did that, then each one of these little things would be a 10th. That's not good enough. I need that to be a 12th instead. Um, oops, so let me oop, delete that, turn off those labels and pretend that one is not there. <laughs> and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna add another two units to there. And what I would do instead is say that this is my unit. So like ignore that, pretend that that's not there. That's the unit. And it's the unit because I can cut it up into six equal sized pieces. I'm sorry, what am I saying? Six, 12 equal sized pieces. Okay, so now I need to find thirds and fourths. Okay, so let's see, what is a third of this length? Dude, that seems too big. Mm, that seems about right. How many, oops. There we go. Yep. Two, three, there we go. You see what I mean? This is why you want to be able to not label the things because that's a third. Each one of those purple things is a third. And then we need fourths. So it should be the next one down, I think in this case, because of that relative primeness. Yep, there it is. So we know what's going to represent a third. We know what's going to represent a fourth. And now we can proceed, right? Actually, let me write that a little better one fourth. So this is me doing the scratch work. Now that we've got our scale, let's do the actual operation. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take all these and delete them. And I'm going to erase this. Uh, I'm going to keep this, uh, I'm going to keep this part up here saying that that's my referent unit, just so that everybody is clear that that's my referent unit. You got to choose a referent unit and you got to label it. Okay. Got to every time. All right. So now we're doing one third minus a fourth. So here's my third. All right, and then here's my fourth, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna say this. Here's one third, oh, <laughs> ah, go back. This is one third, I'm gonna label that as one third. I'm gonna label this as one fourth. And if we're doing one third minus one fourth, then what we're looking for is this right here. This right here is one third minus one fourth. But what is that size? One of these one third minus one fourth, but each one of those is how much? One twelfth. It's one twelfth. One twelfth. Because that's the space, right? That's the space in between. So remember I was saying uh, earlier, these are more about length, not area. So you don't want to think about area, you want to think about length. And remember I keep talking about differences as the distance between those two numbers. That's exactly what's going on here. And you can see it manifest in this manipulative. The distance between one third and one fourth is one twelfth. And it's exactly right there. It's the same as if it were a number line. In fact, if you were to show this on a number line, you could do exactly this, right? You're basically showing that space between those. So that's how you do it. So I'll stop right there. That's, um, I'll stop with uh, that example. That's how you would do this model. Now we can actually see that the answer is one twelfth. And again, there are other things you can do. You can add other labels. You can do other pictures. I think I might've even done it differently on my solutions. The point is you wanna make it clear and communicative what each of these things are and what you're doing. That's really what it is. Okay, next example. Oh yeah, so that was addition, that was subtraction. Now let's do multiplication. This one is fun. Okay, division is actually my favorite. That's why I love these so much. Division is my favorite thing to model with quiz and air rods. Okay, so the next problem we're gonna do is four, four times two thirds. And we have some options here. We can either do two thirds four times, or we can do two thirds of four. 
And either way will be valid. It's kind of up to you. I think I'm going to do... Hmm, I'm going to do two-thirds four times. Why not? So if I want to do two-thirds, I need to find something that I can, I can actually split up into thirds. So I'm going to go for the, the lowest one, actually. Uh, this one. I can split that up into three equal-sized pieces because it's got three parts, right? I'm going to call that the unit. There we go. I'm going to label it. So if that's my unit, then this is two thirds. There we go. And so the question is, what's four times two thirds? Well, I need four of those. Ready? One, two, three, four. So how much is four times two thirds? Well, let's just count with our units. Hmm. There we go. So how many units is it? It's one, two, and then how much of another unit? two-thirds, right? So the answer here is <laughs> two and two-thirds. Is that right? I don't know. Let's check. <laughs> Let's see. If I take this length here, that length is four two-thirds, and that length is the same as two and then two-thirds. And there it is. Pretty much it. Don't believe me? You don't have to believe me. You can verify it. You could also do the little algorithm, right? Do the whole like Oh, you know, cross and then plus, right? And you're going to get 6 plus 2 over 3, which is 8 thirds, right? Which is 2 and 2 thirds, same thing. Because right over here, this would be 8 times, or 8 thirds if you use the algorithm, where you just multiply across. So there it is. That's how you model multiplication. Um, if you wanted to do 2 thirds of 4, let me show you how to do that instead. Let me, I'll just clear everything here. Clear. I'm going to keep that as my unit. And if I want to do 2 thirds of 4, then I need to start with 4 units. There we go. And I need to be able to split this up into uh, three equal size pieces. Can we do that? Ah, we can. There we go. So we're doing two thirds of four. Hmm, let's see. This is why I don't like the labels now, because that's four thirds of the unit. But in this case, we're trying to do two thirds of four. So each one of those things is actually representing uh, a third. So I'm going to turn off the labels for a minute. Um, so we need two thirds of four and that occurs right here. Why? Because this is one thing. In fact, you know what? I, yeah. In fact, I'm going to say this, uh, I'm going to write it like this. And this is one way you can write this. This is one third of four, one third of four, one third of four, just to indicate that that's not one third of the unit. It's not one third of the unit because the unit is right here. It's not one third of the unit. It's one third of four, okay? So now if we look at where this dividing line is, we can figure out exactly how much this is. This is one, two, oops, that's a terrible brace there. <laughs> there we go, two plus two thirds equals two and two thirds or eight thirds if you prefer. And there it is again, boom, that's the answer. So you can do it either way. They're super flexible. That's what's so awesome. Okay, um, let's do division. Yeah, let's do division. Division is my favorite. Okay, here we go. Too excited, too excited. All right, so we're going to do the problem three-fourths divided by one-eighth. Three-fourths divided by one-eighth. Okay, and now let's see. What does this actually mean? Think about that. What does this actually mean? This means how many eighths fit inside of three-fourths? That's the question. How many eighths fit inside of three-fourths? Uh, well, if I need to talk about eighths and fourths, then my least common denominator is eight. So I'm going to pick something that I can divide up into eight equal-sized pieces to represent my unit. So I think that's the, the brown one. Let me double check. Three, three, eight. Yes. Okay. So this is what's going to be my unit. And the reason I did that is because I can pick out eighths, right? Let me label all here. Now this is one eighth. So if I want to know how many eighths fit inside of three fourths, it's super easy. Check this out. Let's get rid of that. Oh, sorry, put that back. Um, let's get rid of this for a minute. There we go. Uh, where's three fourths? Hmm. Three fourths of that. It's not reducing. It's... Yeah, let's see. Okay right here. There we go. So I have to lay it actually on the, so that's another glitch. I have to actually lay it on the board before it changes the uh, option to reduce or not. Um, so that's three fourths. And the question is how many eighths fit inside? You ready? This is the best part. 
One, two, three, four, five, six. So how many fit inside there? Well, one, two, three, four. Actually, I wouldn't even do that. No, I don't wanna do that. I wanna say that these are different things. This right here is six. So the answer is six. That's it. That's how you do division with queens and air rods. Isn't that so cool? It's so awesome. That's all it is. Yeah, the answer is six. Again, if you don't believe me, don't believe me. You can rely on that algorithm, especially now that we know that the algorithm is actually true. So three-fourths divided by one-eighth. We know that that's equal to three-fourths times eight over one, which is 18 over four. Is that right? Oh, sorry, not 18. Blech. I was like, that doesn't sound right. Uh, three times eight is 24 over four, which is six. There it is again. How amazing is that? So this is how you would model uh, three fourths divided by one sixth or uh, one eighth, my bad. Um, again, it's not too bad. Uh, you just got to remember to actually pick your referent unit and you have to pick your referent unit uh, carefully to make it work the way you want. Okay, so those are my examples. Um, let me go back to the slides. And like I said, if, it, if it's tricky, because I know quiz and air rods are tricky to learn the first time. They were very tricky for me to learn the first time. But once I worked with them for a little while, it was just like, whoa, this is amazing. Um, okay, let me go back to uh, the slides here. Give me one second. Okay. <clears throat> do, do, do. All right, so here's what I want you to do. So at home, I want you to use your quiz and air rods using one of those manipulatives and like the website, for example. And I want you to uh, model the following and compute them just to get some practice with it, all right? So I'm gonna go ahead and throw up the thinker here. Actually, I'll say the thinker and the writer. So go ahead and take several minutes, as long as you need, to try to do several of these problems. Um, and you should try to do at least one of each operation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And we'll do more of these in the collaboration meeting. But go ahead and try it out. All right, let's move on. So uh, this is where I want you to do a comparison. So you took that time to do those with quiz and air rods using one of those virtual manipulatives. Now what I want you to do is I want you to try to do the same problems, the exact same problems, these problems right here, they're the same as on the previous page, but I want you to try to use pattern blocks instead. So that's what we saw uh, earlier. I didn't show you how to do multiplication or division with pattern blocks, but I think you could probably figure it out because you remember what multiplication is and you remember what division is. Um, so go ahead and try to do that right now at home. Try it out, okay? All right, and let's move on. This is one of the reasons I was saying you should try to watch these in groups, because if you're watching them in groups, you can like talk to each other and play. It's really fun, right? Okay, so this is one of the reasons why I wanted you to do this at home. So I really hope you did actually do this at home. <laughs> Um, but uh, before we do the activity, we're going to discuss the following questions. So make sure to ponder them for a while and uh, to prepare. So that, and, and also this, yeah, share how you felt and what that experience was like when you were working with the quiz and air rods and the pattern blocks. I'm sure that some of it was really easy. Some of it was really hard. Some of it was fun. Some of it was aggravating. Share all those. We would love to hear those emotions and that experience. It's really edifying for all of us to know uh, what people go through using these things. Um, and then think about these. These questions in particular, what difficulties did you encounter when you were using the pattern blocks or the quiz and air rods? Uh, were there any problems that seemed easier with the, with the pattern blocks or easier with the quiz and air rods? And which ones seemed the most difficult? And why do you think they were the most difficult? Think about it, all right? Okay, um, all right, so at the beginning of this section, we talked about this. We said, do we need to pay attention to the unit we're referring to when we divide like we did with multiplication? Absolutely, absolutely yes. From the quiz and air rods and the pattern blocks, you can see that the answer is definitely yes. You definitely need to pay attention to the, to the referent unit. And the truth is you always will. You always will in any operation, even multiple, I'm sorry, even um, addition and subtraction, you have to pay attention to the referent unit. Um, all right, so here's an example. Uh, Kathleen had a three quarters of a gallon of milk. She gave each of her cats one twelfth of a gallon how many cats does she have? Hmm, think about that for a minute.
Hmm. She's trying to figure out how many cats she has, right? Okay, let's talk about it here. How many cats does she have? Well, let's look at this. Notice that each cat is getting half, or sorry, one twelfth of a gallon. So the gallon is the referent unit. The gallon is the referent unit. So one twelfth of a gallon is how much each cat is getting, right? Twelfth of a gallon. Um, so the question is asking how many twelfths of a gallon are in three fourths of a gallon? Because if she's only got three fourths of a gallon and she's giving out twelfths, she's doing this repeated subtraction. What is that repeated subtraction? That's division. So we're dividing three fourths by one twelfth, right? That's what we're doing. That's the actual mathematical problem that's going on. Three fourths divided by one twelfth. And that's equal to 36 over four, which is nine. So um, she's got nine cats. So I don't know, does that make somebody a cat person? If they got nine cats? I don't know. <laughs> You'll have to let me know. <laughs> At what point does somebody become a cat person, right? Like a cat lady or something. Um, Okay, so let's finish this up with this. Uh, some issues for learning. Oops, sorry, that should say that should say issues for learning. Uh, there we go, issues for learning. So the following question was proposed to a group of eighth graders. So these are students that are going to be entering high school later, right? High school at the end of the year. At one school, three fourths of all the eighth graders went to one baseball game. Two thirds of those eighth graders who went to the game traveled traveled by car. What part of all the eighth graders traveling by car, I'm sorry, what part of all the eighth graders traveled by car to the game? So think about this for just a minute. Just ponder it for a minute and think it, see if you can figure it out. Okay, now try to say out loud what you were just thinking. See if it makes more sense when you say it out loud in your own words. Try that. Okay, now let's talk about it. Uh, first of all, this is the question that you're, they're being asked to compute. So notice what the referent units are. So first here it says three fourths of what? Remember, anytime anybody gives you a fraction or a ratio like that, you always ask of what? Three fourths of all the eighth graders. So that's three fourths of the eighth graders. Then it says two thirds of what? Right, here's two thirds of what? Of those eighth graders who went to the game, so the referent unit has changed. It's two thirds of those people that went to the game and only three fourths of eighth graders went to a game. And then the question says, what part of all the eighth graders, all the eighth graders traveled by car to the game? So it's literally gonna be two thirds of three fourths of all of the eighth graders. There's, we can kind of see that like, you see that two thirds of three fourths of one the unit in this case is the eighth graders, is the all the eighth graders, that's the referent unit at the end. And what does that turn out to be? It turns out to be one half. Two thirds of three quarters is one half. And there you go. So here's the thing. Only about 12% of the eighth graders that saw this problem chose to multiply. 12%, <laughs> right? So that's about one eighth of all of the eighth graders that saw this problem thought that it was a multiplication problem, all right? Uh, over 55% of them decided to subtract. They decided to subtract. So over half of the students decided that this was a subtraction problem. Why could that be? Think about it for a minute. Just think about it and see if you can see why they might think it's a subtraction problem. All right, now I want you to speak out loud and see if you can explain why. Okay, so now let's talk about it together. Um, in my opinion, I think they decided to subtract because they knew that they had to take something away from three fourths, right? And so they tried to do three fourths minus two thirds. It's a bad three, <laughs> two thirds. And that's why they did that. But that's just because they're not understanding the context of the question. They don't understand what the referent unit is. That's the idea, the referent unit. 8% um, decided to divide. So essentially, <laughs> You got to realize that very, very few students were actually able to correctly interpret this question and make sense of it. Um, and these are eighth graders. These are students that are going to be entering high school, right? 13 year olds, 14 year olds, 12 year olds. So it's, it's kind of surprising that they're getting this far and still unable to make sense of this type of problem. And I'm telling you, 
It's because they struggle with the fractions themselves and they struggle with the symbols. They, they're, they're too focused on the symbols. They have to make sense of the numbers and make sense of the referent units, the referent units, all right? So that's one of the issues for learning. Um, oh yeah, so here you go. In the interviews, children suggested this. I wanted less than three fourths, so I have to do something to get a smaller number, so I need to subtract or divide. Hmm. Right. So this leads us to an issue here. Research shows that many elementary students and even some adults actually believe that multiplication makes bigger and division makes smaller. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. That's never that's never guaranteed to be the case. It depends. It's not always going to multiplication is not always going to give you something bigger and division is not always going to give you something smaller. But students and adults associate those operations to increases or decreases, but that's not, that's not really what's happening. Um, yeah, this messes people up. This really, really messes people up. And I think, is this a, oh yeah, I have this example. So um, uh, sometimes I'm a university supervisor and I actually get to have student teachers where I go and observe them teach when they're getting their teaching credential. And it's essentially the last step if you want to get your teaching credential. You, you apply to the program, you go through it, and then at the very end, you have to go out to a school and you student teach at that school. And you'll have a master teacher to guide you. And you'll also have a university supervisor that comes and observes you and reports back about how you're doing and gives you help and assistance and helps you kind of grow yourself as a teacher. Well, I was uh, observing one of my student teachers at Wilson High School, and he was teaching the class how to graph parabolas. So you remember doing this back in algebra where you had a function and it was a parabola and it was in vertex form and it was written like this, right? Uh, squared plus K. If you don't remember this, that's totally fine. We're not going to cover this in this class. I'm just using this as an example. Actually, I want to rotate that. Shh. Come on. Hey. There we go. Um, so this is the thing. He was talking about what this number does. So you might remember that uh, the H here gives you the X coordinate of the vertex. Uh, the K here gives you the Y coordinate. Wait, is it X minus H? I think it's X minus H. My bad. There we go. Uh, the K, K gives you the Y coordinate of the vertex, but this number A in the front here, this number A gives you a lot of information. It tells you if the, if the parabola opens up or if it opens down. It tells you if it's stretched, if, if it's stretched vertically, right? It's a vertical stretch, right? Um, and so th the thing is, if, it's, if that number is big, then it stretches the parabola like this. And so I think the example that he had on the board was this one. He had F of X equals four thirds times x plus two squared minus four or something like that. And he was going through and he was like, okay, so what does this tell us? What's gonna happen? And there, the whole class shouts out, it shifted up by four units. And he's like, what's this? And he, they're like, it shifted to the left by, by two units, right? And he's like, good, good. And he's like, okay, this one, uh, does the parabola open up or down? And everyone's like, it opens up because it's a positive number. And then he says, okay, is it stretched or compressed? And the whole room was silent because they're just like, hmm, I don't know. Is it stretched or compressed, right? And then somebody after like, you know, 10 or 15 seconds says, oh, it's, uh, it's compressed, right? And he goes, yeah, that's right. It's compressed because this number is a fraction. And so that means that it's going to be smaller. And I was like, I was in the back and I was like, no, I'm just kidding. I wasn't like that. I was just like, oh no, uh, because that's incorrect. This actually is a vertical stretch. It's going to be stretched vertically because of this factor right here. And the reason has nothing to do with the fact that it's a fraction at all. The fact that it's a fraction has nothing to do with the vertical stretch or the vertical compression. The, the thing that determines if it's a stretch or a compression is the size of the number. In particular, if this number is bigger than one, if I should say, yeah, if it's greater than one, then it's gonna stretch vertically. And if it's in between zero and one, actually I should say strict, if it's in between zero and one, then it's gonna be a compression. Really, I should say absolute value, there we go. The absolute value, if the, if the, the magnitude of that number is between zero and one, then it's gonna compress things. And why is that the case? Well, let's look at the structure. Uh, let me see if I can erase some of this stuff. There we go. Erase that, 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 that. Yeah, look at the structure. So let, let's pretend this doesn't exist for now. Let's just look at the front here. Um, this right here is just some number, 
whatever it is. You plug in an x value, you get a number. Plug in x equals 1, and you're going to get 9, okay? So let's pretend that. Let's pretend that that number is 9 instead. So if that number is 9, then what we're really looking at is this, 4 thirds times 9. Well, 4 thirds is bigger than 1. So if I multiply 9 by 4 thirds, I'm going to have at least one whole 9, and then another third of a 9. So it's going to be bigger, right? It's going to be a bigger number. So it has nothing to do with the fact that it's a fraction. It has everything to do with the size. And that's why it's very important not to make those mistakes because this messes people up. And if you do that kind of stuff, people start to think that, okay? That's why you got to be very, very careful. Anyway, um, yeah, it's only when you're taking part of a quantity that you end up with a smaller number. That's the idea. Okay, so we're just about done here, but I wanted to show you, I wanted to close this lecture with these two videos. The videos are only like uh, a minute and a half, I think, each, but um, the, it's fun to watch children do these fractions. So let me pull that up here and let's watch those. Okay. <laughs> One second, looks like I lost the window. Come on. There we go. Got the window. I think that's right. Huh. Hold on one second here. I might have to make sure that my uh, audio is working correctly here. We're going to find out in just a second here. Mm -hmm. OK. Let me do this. Actually, hold on. <laughs> just bear with me. I'll give you like a visual cue. Um, let me see. I need to move that to the bottom. Sorry about the quality of these videos, by the way. They're quite old, um, but they still they still work, right? They're still edifying, and these are still children doing exactly what we want to talk about in this class. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, I'm going to see if this works here. Let me see if the audio picks up appropriately. Ah, it does. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's take a look at this. This is Felicia, and she's going to do this uh, addition problem. So let's listen up. So, how did you figure that out? There are three fourths. Wait. There are three fourths and one half. And so I. This would be half. This would be the half right here. And this would be. You'd only need two more fourths to make a whole one. So that, these are the two fourths, and then you have one more fourth, and so that's that's one more fourth from this, and so that's one. If this would be the one whole, and this would be one fourth. Beautiful. There it is. Yeah, that's exactly right, right? So notice that when she went to do it, she wasn't talking about like common denominators or anything like that, actually. She wasn't even trying to do the algebra. She was just drawing the pictures. She was making the model. And once that model worked, whoa, things are bouncing around, wild. Once that model worked, um, oh, man, I moved all my stuff around. Uh, then she was able to figure out what it was. Okay, one second here. So bizarre. Okay, let's look at the next video here. This is uh, Elliot, and Elliot's going to tell us a little bit about how to how to work with fractions. Can you work that problem, Elliot? Oh, wait one second. <laughs> Come back here. Come back here. Come back here. Got to change the, the window here. There we go. Okay. All right. So, Elliot, take it away.
Oh, yeah. And how did you get that so fast? Um, one third goes into one three times because there's three pieces in one hole. Can you draw a picture of it? So what have you drawn? One third. And it goes into one hole. If I cut that into thirds three times because I've got one of these, this will connect to this one, this will connect to that one, and this will connect to that one. Is that what division means? Yeah, how many times that goes into that? Okay, nice job. Can you explain your answer? Mm-hmm. Uh, like up there, all you did was add one half, so it was the answer was three if I didn't have... If this was not there, the answer would be three but that is there, and one third goes into one half one time, and now that I've got one sixth left, two sixths equals one third, and three sixths equals one half. So I take away two sixths because I've taken away a third out of the one half, and I have one sixth left. I see just how you thought about that. Nice job. Wow. See, isn't that amazing? Like, they can figure it out. It makes sense to them when they have the models. They don't need the algorithms and the algebra. They just need the models to make sense of it. Okay, so let's go back to the slides here, and we'll wrap it up here in just a second. Um, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, where am I? Okay, got it. All right, so what's left? Uh, that's it. All right, so let's play. Let's take a look at activity 7B here should be very similar to what you did last night, or I should say what you did right now when you were watching the lecture. Let's see, oh yeah, okay, so you're gonna have to draw an area model for some products, right? Area model for some fractional products. There you go, a bunch of those. Uh, model these things on a number line. Use Cuisinair rods to model these and compute the following. Go. And that's pretty much it. So that's the whole activity. So you're just kind of using Cuisinair rods and using the area model and just getting some practice together and helping each other work through it. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. Uh, again, as always, thank you for bearing with the long lectures uh, and I will see you in the collaboration meetings. Have a good one.